Thank you very much. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here at this beautiful place, wonderful conference. So today I will uh, report on work that I've done uh, with my wonderful student, uh, Shinan Zhu. Uh, we had a short uh, letter a few months ago, and there are uh, two long papers that should really appear any day. Um, in fact, uh, this is a problem uh, that I used to work on 20 years ago, uh, and with Shinan's help, I'm uh, really glad that I finally solved it. Um, so this historic reference actually um, helps me put things in perspective. Uh, we are celebrating uh, 20 years of ADSCFT, but uh, my contention is that we are still really learning, we haven't quite yet learned how to use the holographic dictionary efficiently. And here I'm not speaking about some deep uh, aspects of quantum gravity, even something as pedestrian as the perturbative calculation of holographic correlation functions uh, is actually very hard. It has not been put uh, yet, uh, it has not been streamlined to the point where we can do calculations easily. And a dramatic illustration of, uh, of uh, this fact is uh, a class of observables which are sort of the first that were originally computed and we're still struggling very much to compute them, which is correlation functions of local operators in the paradigmatic example, which is n equal 4 to pair mills um, and type 2b string theory. And so these are the familiar one half BPS operator. This is local operators which are obtained by taking the trace of the uh, the symmetric tracer combinations of the SO6 indices where X is, um, XI is, uh, are the six fundamental scalars of n equal four superior mills. Uh, and these correlation functions, of course, are protected uh, for uh, two-point and three-point functions, uh, but they receive quantum corrections for n greater or equal than four. They are extremely complicated objects. And so, in fact, it's natural and, and not surprising that these would be complicated objects for final n and for, for final lambda. For large n and final lambda, integrability should come to the rescue. Uh, but really, what is the excuse uh, for not being able to compute these objects even in the extreme uh, regime of large n and large lambda, where, after all, we are told this should just be computed by uh, some three-level uh, supergravity, you know, S5 times S5. And so, um, in fact, uh, the casual observer might be excused for thinking that this problem was solved long ago, but not at all. In fact, this is a summary of the state of affairs before our work. So the best studied example is the S5 times S5. The hardest case is where the weights of the external operators are equal, and only three cases have been computed with enormous amount of work, heroic efforts by several groups, have led to push the calculation only up to p equal to 4. Uh, only the supergraviton four-point function has been computed for ADS7 times S4. Essentially, nothing has been done for ADS3 and nothing at all for ADS4. And believe me, this is not for lack of trying. Uh, and so this sorry state of affairs should be contrasted with the beautiful progress that has been accomplished in the context of perturbative gauge theory amplitudes in flat space. So recent years have seen this blossoming of results, beautiful geometric structures, very efficient calculational methods, and none of this is in fact available in, uh, in the context of ADSFT. And so that's actually really our ideology. We should organize these calculations following the blueprint of the modern on-shell approach to perturbative gauge theory amplitudes. And trying to expand diagrammatically is the wrong way to think about the problem. The answer truly is simple, as I will as I hope that will convince you, uh, and one should not focus on its expansion in diagrams, rather directly jump to the, per, to the final answer, which, which uh, one should attempt to fix by general consistency requirements. Um, and technically, what we will find extremely useful is uh, the use of the Malley representation of conformal field theory correlators. Now, of course, um, one uh, does not want to compute for uh, its own sake, although I was taught that there's no a shame, uh, no shame in computing. Uh, but the idea here is uh, uh, clearly to try to uncover some hidden elegant structure. And uh, perhaps one should feel entitled that such a, uh, 
to such a structure, given that after all in a suitable limit, CFT correlators reduce to flat space scattering amplitudes where uh, precisely this kind of ge elegant geometric structures have been found. And so our main result will be a extremely simple, in fact, strikingly simple, uh, uh, complete answer for the four-point function for arbitrary weights, which translates in arbitrarily kaluza klein levels on the supergravity side, in, again, in the classical superclerical limit, in the case of n equal force per mills. And I will also mention some other partial results. And indeed, we are finding that things are much simpler than previously anticipated. So um, I will now give you a lightning review of the traditional method, which is a standard Feynman perturbation theory in position space. Uh, so I will remind the LRGN, of course, the leading contribution come from disconnected diagrams, which are trivial because the product of two-point functions are, are protected. So the first interesting uh, uh, contribution comes from the order one of n square. And on the gravity side, one is instructed to compute the sum of these three-level Witten diagrams, which are just position space Feynman diagrams, where the external legs are treated differently than the internal legs. So, so this is a sketch of antidecitta space. The interior is the, is the space, and the, uh, the circle represents the boundary, which is flat space where the field theory live. And Z and W are bulk coordinates, so you have a bulk-to-bulk -bulk propagator, which boundary conditions such that it decays fast near the boundary, whereas the bulk-to-boundary propagators that go from a point X on the boundary to a point Z in the interior are obey Dirichlet type boundary conditions, which is the reflection of the fact that the external legs are really are, in some appropriate sense, LSZ reduced. This is an on-shell diagram. And the vertices are obtained by painful uh, and really difficult nonlinear Kaluza Klein reduction of 2B supergravity on the phi sphere. And so um, the calculation of the diagram itself, uh, themselves, takes a bit of work, but it was streamlined in a series of early papers in which I was involved. Uh, and the basic building block is this so called D function, which is defined for external dimension delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, delta 4. So it depends on the four external points. In fact, by conformal invariance, it can be reduced just uh, to a function of the two cross ratios. And the point Z here is a point in the bulk of ADS, which is integrated over. I'm sorry, what did I do? Um, uh, and these are relatively straightforward special functions. The D111 is the scalar box integral, which is related to the dialogarithm function and the higher ones are obtained by taking derivatives. And rather remarkably, and this is somewhat miraculous, and I do not have a deep understanding of this fact, but we discovered uh, 18 years ago that for the case of interest, which is phi times S5, all exchange diagrams can in fact be reduced to a finite sum of these, uh, of these um, contact diagrams. This is not true in general. So for example, it is definitely not true for ADS4 times S7, which is one of the reasons why this has been such a difficult case to treat. And here I'm giving you an example. If you take the four external dimension to be equal to P and the four internal dimension to be an even integer delta, which of course is precisely what happens in ADS5 times S5, but it would not be the case in a generic background, then this exchange diagram is a simple finite sum of these D functions. Now the really hard part uh, is, in fact, combining these diagrams, taking into account the combinatorics, which become increasingly complicated as, as the weights of the external states increase, and weighting the diagrams with the appropriate couplings. In fact, the quartic couplings take 15 pages just to write down, and after heroic uh, efforts, people computed, uh, as I said, up to P equal to 4, but it's hopeless to go beyond by this method. And one sees some hopeful hints of simplifications by doing a lot of algebra, but what's worse really is that after you have done all this work, you don't know what to do with it because the answers take a completely non-transparent form. Even extracting the leading OP singularity takes some amount of fiddling. So clearly there must be a better way and our prejudice in revisiting this problem is after all, this must all be fixed by symmetry. Why is that? Because what these correlation functions are encoding is just on shell type 2b supergravity, who is uniquely fixed by the fact it's two derivative supergravity theory and by maximum supersymmetry. And so we 
tried then to implement the symmetries directly. And so then I will have to tell you a little bit about kinematics or how to efficiently, uh, efficiently encode the symmetry structure. In fact, this has been on for a long time. What you should do uh, is put the art symmetry part on a somewhat uh, symmetric footing as the sp uh, space-time part. So you contract these SO6 uh, indices with some null vectors. T lives in a six-dimensional space. And for simplicity, I will focus on the four-point function with equal weights in most of the talk. And then it just follows from the bosonic subgroups of the full symmetry group, which is the conformal and the art symmetry group, that uh, the correlation function is really just a function of the two conformal cross ratios, u and v, which are the standard ones. I'm using capital letters u and v because um, soon enough, uh, u uh, non-capital will have a different use. And then in complete analogy, one also defines some cross ratios, sigma and tau, for the art symmetry part. So this makes the uh, symmetry between S5 and ADS5 um, somewhat more transparent. But of course, it should be kept in mind that the art symmetry part uh, encodes transformation property of the finite di dimensional representation of SU4, and so really, this is just a polynomial in sigma and tau. This is just a convenient way to organize a finite set of functions of the cross ratio. The non-trivial dependent is in the cross ratios and this uh, GMN just encode group theoretic factors. Now, this is just using the bosonic subgroup of the uh, symmetry group. We should also look at the fermionic symmetries. And this takes a little bit of analysis that was done in these papers. And then one discovers, in fact, that you perform the following change of variables that is very familiar in, in people working in conformal field theory these days. You replace the, the conformal cross ratios u by z times z bar and v times 1 minus z 1 minus z bar. And use something completely analogous for the art symmetry cross ratios. Then this function g, which is now thought as a function of z, z bar, alpha, and alpha bar, is such that if you replace alpha bar with 1 over z bar, a priori, this would be a function of three variables because you're setting two of them equal. In fact, the z-bar dependence drops out. So this is the content of the fermionic symmetries. This may seem a little mysterious, but those of you who have followed some other part of my recent work will perhaps recognize that the emergence of a meromorphic structure out of a four-dimensional superconformal field theory is precisely what you accomplish when you lock some part of the earth symmetry dependence with the space-time dependence, and you distill this chiral algebra that we have been working on. And this is precisely the statement here. So one can solve the word identity by finding a particular homogeneous solution, which you may as well take to be the one given by free field, doing big contractions in free field theory. And then a piece, which you see by construction, obeys the constraint that it should vanish when alpha bar is equal to one over z bar. In fact, by symmetry, also when z equal uh, one over alpha, etc. this should be true. And so this takes into account that property. And of course, there is some boundary condition on this dynamical function h, such that if I set z bar uh, equal one over alpha bar, this does not develop a pole that cancels the zero. So there is some regularity probably on, on h, otherwise it would be an empty statement. But this is the complete solution then of the word identity. And then now really what you're after is computing this curly h because the symmetries I've done all that they could do for you. And so our first go at the problem was then the following simple thought. Why should we do all this work and painfully computing the vertices in supergravity? Let's just write an ansatz in terms of the appropriate class of special functions and impose word identities. Since we know, after all, that exchange diagrams must reduce to a finite sum of contact diagrams, let's just write an ansatz of this kind where this is an appropriate set of contact diagrams. You have to be a little bit careful about, about how you do this. You have to really input the fact that we precisely know which fields in supergravity uh, appear, uh, and we have to know how they decompose in contact diagrams, but we, all, we know all of that, and we can input this information, and that this leads to uh, an answer which is parameterized by a finite set of undetermined parameters. And each deep uh, function can be written as a essentially dialogarithm function, which is the scalar box function, 
a log of u and a log of v and an and, and identity piece, all of which is multiplied by rational function of u and v. And so you know rather precisely the class of functions that your answer uh, should uh, lie into, and then you just impose the superconformal word that had in the previous slide, and lo and behold, this fixes the answer uniquely. So this bypasses entirely the need for knowing the Kaluza-Klein uh, expansion uh, in detail, uh, and it's hopeful because that's what we wanted. We wanted to fix everything by symmetry. Nevertheless, even this method runs out of steam rather fast. We get a new case, p equal to 5, but it's still too hard in general. But it, it gives you a strong hint that in the appropriate language, you should be able to solve the problem using symmetry alone. And the appropriate language is the Mellian representation of conformal field theory correlator. So the Mellian representation makes it transparent that if you're doing computing holographic boundary correlator in ADS, that is really the uh, direct analog of the S matrix in flat space. It's the natural on shell observable. As I was emphasizing earlier, the external legs have been put on shell by Dirac type condition. And here is a sketch of uh, you know, focusing some beams by preparing some wave packets and they scatter in the middle of ADS. In the limit in which you send ADS to flat space by taking the radius to infinity, indeed, this precise reduces in a certain, if you scale dimensions appropriately to the S matrix in flat space. And the standard position space representation of correlators does not do justice to this analogy. The analogy becomes very transparent if you use Mellin space. So what is Mellin space? In fact, in the next few slides, I will review the, a story that um, uh, is um, um, rather uh, um, um, now by standard. And so if you don't want to get anything else out of my talk, this is the main message. But of course, this is standard. And my, uh, the new result are application of this to the ADS case, ADS5 case. And so we do a... Uh, integral transform where we trade the position with uh, this delta ij. Delta ij obey a set of constraints that are such that the number of delta ij is equal to the number of uh, cross ratios. And the point of this definition is that the operator's product expansion of a 1 going to a 2, some generic operator oi, translates into the fact that if I do, if I 1 and 2 come together, then there should be a pole in delta 1, 2, and similarly for all the other channels. In fact, there should be an infinite series of poles uh, related to the descendants. And then this M has factorization properties somewhat analogous to, to a three-level scattering amplitude in flat space, where the OPE tells you how uh, the endpoint function reduces to the N minus one point function. And um, in the case of the four-point function, you should use ST and U variables, Mandelstam-like variables, the sum to delta I, and the crossing symmetry property are analogous to a 2 2 scattering process. And here is a sketch of the analytic structure that follows from a single operator exchanged in the one two channel. There's an infinite tower of poles at the position of the twist of the exchange operator. Now, if you do what, Mel, what Mac instructed us to do, to extract a product of gamma functions, then this curly M has even simpler properties. In particular, the factorization is such that at the, the factorization has polynomial residues. And extraction of these gamma uh, factors is particularly natural for a large end theory because this gamma function precisely capture the contribution of the double trace uh, operators. For example, as we already saw in the, uh, in the other talk, there is an infinite tower of double trace operators of this kind that have dimension equal or twist equal to delta 1 plus delta 2 plus 2n plus over 1 over n squared corrections. And so to leading order than 1 over n squared, these are precisely capturing the contribution of this infinite uh, tower of operators, and so lo and behold, in a large end theory, curly M is truly a meromorphic function with poles only coming from the single traces. In a final end theory, in fact, the analytic property of curly M are complicated because of this accumulation at the twist that uh, Fernando told us uh, earlier, and so it's not clear that these tools are so useful for final end, but for large end, M really has very simple analytic properties. And this is uh, translating to the fact that Witten diagram is extraordinarily simple. This basic uh, contact diagram has Mellin amplitude equal to 1, and exchange diagrams are simple meromorphic functions uh, with uh, computable uh, residues. 
it turns out that the case of interest, which is the S phi times S phi, this, the, the sum of our poles here truncate to some n max, and so in fact, exchange diagrams are in fact rational functions. And so in Melvin space, the amplitudes in the S phi times S phi are some appropriate rational functions, and the truncation has a natural CFT interpretation, which I don't have too much time to explain now, but it's really uh, forced upon us by consistency of the operator Prout expansion. When, uh, if there wasn't a, a single trace pole that overlapped with the double trace pole, then we would find a triple pole, and a triple pole would give us a log square term. A single log of u has an actual interpretation as a correction to the anomalous dimension, but a triple pole could not arise at this order. And so the moral of the story is that we get to impose a set of abstract conditions on the Mellin amplitude M, which is the Mellin transform of this uh, correlator G. Some are obvious. Obviously, crossing symmetry is a certain symmetry when we exchange S and T and sigma and tau. The analytic properties are also obvious. A large and a large lambda, we only have protected operators, so we only have a finite number of simple poles, which are the single trace operators which are exchanged and they are, the residues are polynomial. Uh, we also have a strong uh, opinion about the asymptotic behavior for large S and T, which follows from consistency with the flat space limit. And this actually took a little bit of back and forth uh, with these authors. They were in disbelief at the beginning, uh, but in fact they confirmed that this is indeed the case, as it must be for the flat space limit to be consistent. And the least trivial constraint, and the crucial one, is the superconformal wound identities. This was the identity in, flats, in, in position space. We can meld and transform it, G goes to M. F the free part essentially only contributes some delta functions. And then we introduce a new auxiliary object, which is M tilde, which is the melding transform of the dynamical function H. And then the fact that this R, which was just some simple uh, quadratic polynomial in U and V, um, should give us G, translates into Melnick space into a statement that the actual amplitude that we want is obtained by acting with a certain difference operator that shifts uh, S and T on M tilde. And this is the really non-trivial constraint because uh, when the, the fact that the difference operator acting on M tilde should give us the simple post-structure we had earlier is very hard to solve and in general has no solutions. And so you should, be, you should feel lucky if you find any solution at all. Uh, and this is the solution. It's as simple as it could be. I told you that sigma and tau just capture the group theory dependence, so it's a polynomial in sigma and tau. And for each monomial, there's a single extraordinarily simple function of S, T, and U. Uh, this should be contrasted with the hundreds of sum of D functions that you find in position space. And from this, one can instruct, for example, anomalous dimensions of double trace operators, as was done in the paper today on the archive. Uh, we don't have a complete proof of uniqueness, but we think it's unique. Just let me just, I'm out of time, so let me just flash the result for arbitrary external weights. You see, it's slightly more involved, but really structurally is the same. And I also want to flash this very briefly. For ADS 7 times S4, the results are structurally similar, but significantly more involved. So the ideology is the same. The supergraviton amplitude takes a very simple compact form, but already for p equal to 4, we found a somewhat uninspiring answer, which, however, uh, you know, I would take this any day over a sum of 137 d functions. So Shinan hasn't quite guessed the pattern here, so we don't have an answer uh, for arbitrary pi in ADS7. Uh, he was able to do that beautifully for ADS-5, but we are hopeful that we will do it. And so let me conclude. So um, clearly, an obvious thought, there should be a way to do this using some um, BCFW style, perhaps, recursion relations, and this would be perhaps a route to get a generalization to higher endpoint functions. Uh, uh, Fernando already mentioned this beautiful recent work in doing quantum corrections, by enforcing consistency with OP and crossing. Again, a completely bootstrap style, abstract approach that bypasses the diagrammatic expansion altogether. We have partial results for other backgrounds, and my take home message today really is we're finally learning how to compute uh, these objects. The historic analogy with perturbative amplitude gauge theory, I, I hope, 
is, is, a, is a good one. And so it took decades from the formulation of the final rules to actually find a way to compute things. And we are, I think, finally getting there. And, uh, and of course, the real hope is that there is some beautiful underlying geometry that is waiting to be uncovered. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. So uh, do you have any intuition for why the ADS-7 crosses four results are more complicated than ADS-5 crosses five? Uh, no, I, I don't. Uh, but um, again, so the expression that I, that I showed earlier is um, it's a little unwieldy, but um, you know, I'm, I'm waiting to have an insight for how to write in a slightly better way. I, I, hope, I hope we'll be able to do it. I think the real advance here is that we have a set of algebraic conditions that fix the answer uniquely. That's the hope. In fact, it's so miraculous that, that this condition can be solved at all. Uh, and then, um, yes, it's, well, it's a matter of, of cleverness, I think. Can you tell me what you know, or just give a summary of the results for ADS3 across S3, and perhaps just T4 as the internal manifold? What has been, what yeah, has what been done? Do you know? what are the, can you Very start? little. So there was a recent paper that I, um, I put a reference but didn't talk about by um, Galliani, Just and Russo, where they computed indirectly uh, the heavy, heavy light-light correlator. Uh, light-light is just the lowest mode in the Ramon sector, and then heavy-heavy is for large weights. So indirectly, they have this result, but there's no direct calculation whatsoever, even for the uh, SES energy tensor multi. We're working on it. It is four times S7, on the other hand, is significantly harder because this key simplification that you can uh, reduce to rational functions is not there. Uh, this is a question to both uh, your talk and Fernando's talk. Uh, if you go back in uh, your, uh, your slides. Uh, Which slide? The, the result uh, with the uh, different... Uh, the, uh, final, the final yes, slide? Yes, yes. So you have uh, this collection of uh, integer numbers. Um, no, no. Uh, it was... Um, this slide? No. Uh, well, I, there was a slide with a collection of uh, integer numbers. This, this This one, yes. yes. Um, well, if you can, if you can, if you're gonna tell me some pattern, I would be. be <laughs> yes. What are you <laughs> counting over here? That's Sorry. My question. What are you counting over here? Uh, what am I counting? I I truly have no idea. But yeah, that could be the right question, right? Indeed. So <laughs> the hope is that there is a there is a reformulation of the problem uh, in using some interesting geometry. You are alluding to enumerative geometry. Of course, I have no clue, but. Um, well, perhaps you can ask what we are counting here. That's an easier question. I don't know, eight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's thank uh, Leonardo again.